Hey, Booskies! So today I have a wonderful guest with me today, uh, Kelsey Bro, the assistant curator at Morris Jamel here in New York City. Um, and she will actually be giving us a mini tea taste testing. This is just a preview. She actually goes to historical sites or even private events and she does a historical tea tasting. So if you would like to um, get a longer version or experience her full version, actually you can contact her. I'll put her information down below in the information section. Uh, so Kelsey, please take over. Sure, well I'm actually giving a tea lecture um, on, at Morris Duma Mansion on October 3rd, so that's coming right up. We're going to taste at least four, maybe I'll have a bonus one in there. Um, tea is representing a phase in the mansion's 250 year old history, so that should be exciting. Um, today we're going to kind of sample two teas, but two teas multiple ways. So the first tea that I have today is Bouyi. Um, it's the one that's spelled like Bohia. Bohia, <laughs> yeah, it does. It, uh, it looks totally different than how it's pronounced. Um, it comes from the Wuyi Mountains in more western China, which is more west than most westerners <laughs> got to get in China at the time. It looks like this. Um, so if you were an 18th century person and I showed you this tea, what would you think about it? Would you think it's black tea, green tea? I would say that's black tea. You'd be wrong. <laughs> so what is yeah. that? Well, see, 18th century people don't know a lot about tea. Some of them do because some did go to China mm -hmm. and speak to people. But most of them were very convinced, despite accurate reports to the contrary, that black tea, green tea, and what this kind of tea is, which is oolong, all came from different plants. Oh. So even though some people knew that it's just, you know, the way you process it, people were very adamant that black tea and green tea, they're not the same plant. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an oolong tea, and what's really interesting is you see this kind of tea because it was really popular. I think what about like 30-40% of the tea that was tossed over in the Boston Tea Party was actually this kind of tea. And um, this is a, more of a, a mid to high end type of tea, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a waste. <laughs> oh no, yeah, because I was just about to ask you because um, when I do go to the markets, this is the kind I see as the more expensive. And, yeah, because uh, like, you're kind of pointing out that um, the size of the leaf is actually pretty big. This yes. is like an inch long here. So, um, yeah, give it a smell. You are definitely right. A lot of good smells out of this tea. I like this one. Yeah, it's very fragrant. It? Yeah, fragrant for sure. I can't. It's like a perfume for the mouth. <laughs> yeah, there's no oh, word for really describing nice. tea smells, just like for wine and stuff like that. Ooh. So um, this one, I would say, is very fragrant. It has a floral overtone with stone fruit notes in it, kind of like um, nectarine, peach, that kind of stuff. I kind smell of, that. Yeah, w once you hear it, you kind of know, just like when you have wine, you're like, oh, this wine is so oaky, because you know that that's a word to describe that mm -hmm. taste or smell. So. Um, this kind of tea was one of the higher end teas, and people would brew this tea with boiling water um, for actually a, almost the same amount of time that we do it today. Um, later on, people would try to brew it for longer to get more out of the tea. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about the colonial period here. Tea costs a lot of money, <laughs> especially in the colonies, although you could get a lot of underhand smuggled tea. Um, people are not wasting their tea if they can on brewing bad tea. They're going to actually try to brew it well, yes. which is kind of interesting for a lot of people today. They think about Lipton tea. And, mm, um, <laughs> I mean, Lipton makes some nice stuff, they do, but the, the kind that you usually see at a restaurant or on an airplane or something, the tea bag, it's all dusty. That was tea that was not being shipped yes. to anywhere at this time. We, we're definitely tea snobs. Um, <laughs> you more so than me, but uh, I, I've been known to be called a tea snob. I have to admit, I'm guilty yes. of that moniker. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Why is my tea dusty? <laughs> yeah, definitely don't want any dusty tea. And people were very picky. When British people went over to buy their tea, they would go to the warehouse, they would see how it was processed, and then it was imported on really big ships into England, and then it would be auctioned off to smaller retailers who would then sell it to grocers who would sell it to individual customers 
so they would evaluate this at the customs house in China and especially at the auction house in England saying is it if it's dusty um, or the, the leaves look dusty as in they look dusty or they're dusty as in they're so finely ground that they look like dust uh, that was like ah. right they, they weren't bidding on that tea <laughs> so um, they, they really did care about the aroma the color the texture of their tea and should we taste it? Absolutely, I'm so excited. Let's get started. All right, so this is actually a pretty cool new design um, that you can tilt to brew your tea. It's about $20 retail. So we're gonna use this to brew the tea today because it allows you to stop it at the appropriate time and also to see the colors. So Perfect. that's pretty nice. I'm gonna put um, about two spoonfuls in okay. here to get a nice good liqueur, you know, the term for the brew tea. Liqueur. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, that should be good. Okay. Take this spirally out of here. Don't worry, hands clean. <laughs> no, no. Alright, so let's get some hot water. This is water that has just been brought to the boil and now it's cool for a little bit, about two minutes. So once you have poured the water in, how long will you let it sit? Two and a half minutes for this type of tea. Okay. You know, I want it to be strong, but not too strong. Okay, so shall I start the timer, or do you have like a, I mean, <laughs> I know you do this a lot, so do you develop like a natural clock in your head? Yeah, when you brew different types of tea, you can just sort of tell by the smell and the color of the <laughs> liqueur, but it also depends on the teaware that you're using. Uh, this is actually the teaware I use at my desk at work. Um, <laughs> So you're very used to this one. Yeah, well it's sort of new to me. I usually at home use um, a variety of different Japanese teapots because mm -hmm. I usually drink Japanese green tea. <laughs> um, surprise, that's what we're tasting next. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> a little sneak preview for this one. <laughs> so, do we have about a minute left here. Um, mm -hmm. While we're waiting for our tea to steep, smelling good, right? Oh, it yes. Smells, no, it smells really good. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this type of tea. So this type of tea actually is retailed by a number of brands that sell colonial style teas. And I put that in air quotes <laughs> because if you drink their bouillie tea, you will notice that it is smoky, which this is not. <laughs> um, this is the real deal. I got it from a tea company I trust in China. Um, bouillie tea is not smoky. I have asked other tea experts um, why then so many companies sell it as smoky, and we're really not sure. Part of it <laughs> might be because later on, um, you know, in the early eight, uh, 19th century, people started calling any type of tea that was kind of middling to lower quality mm -hmm. bouillie tea, because the name didn't always correspond like it does today to the actual type of tea, as in the way it was processed and the grade or quality of the tea. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a mix match of um, just basically giving it a name that sounds good for people. So yes. people would market um, teas of all types of qualities under the name Bui, and so many people were importing pretty bad tea and calling it Bui. <laughs> but it just started to be a name Major like that. shade thrown here. <laughs> I mean, I like but it as tea, you know, but... But, like, please call it by the correct name. Yeah, right? like those 19th century people. <laughs> no, um, so the smoky tea, well, when it's supposed to be smoky, it's very nice. I enjoy it a lot. Um, it's not a bouillie quality mm -hmm. when you're talking about real bouillie as people would have enjoyed it in the 18th century. Um, it's just maybe something that happened because actually the letter B it was marked on tea chests um, to mean bouillie, but it was also marked on tea chests to mean burnt. So maybe there was some confusion there, people calling the oh. burnt tea bouillie because they're both marked with a B. Yeah, that wasn't confusing Ooh. at all. <laughs> so, right. um, lots of different reasons that could be. Also, burnt tea was known to be a lower quality. Mm -hmm. So again, the mix up between what is it actually, what is mm -hmm. it called for, for real, what did people call it to retail it to try to sell something inferior for more money than they really mm -hmm. should, um, all sorts of reasons. So this is the real deal, and we're going to try it in true 19th century fashion, as I'm spilling, um, <laughs> this is a, meant survive. to actually be drunk out of this cup, but we're going to be mm -hmm. polite and share. <laughs> um, tilt it this way so it doesn't steep anymore. You can see it has a really nice amber color. Um, this is really mm -hmm. the color that you want to get out of your oolong tea, especially this kind of darker 
oolong tea with a lot of strong smells, a lot of good stone fruit coming out of there. That smells so good. Yeah. So, but unfortunately, at least I think it's unfortunately, oh, in true 19th gosh. century fashion, let's put some sugar in. Oh my gosh, but it smells so good already. I know. Well, part of the appeal of tea was not even so much that it tastes good, mm -hmm. but that you could serve it in exotic things, you could serve it with expensive sugar. Tea was really, really expensive. Yeah. So it's showing off. It is. It's all about showing off. It's like, off. ooh, look at my expensive booty with <laughs> uh, my expensive sugar. Yeah. And then you guys know how to drink it. So our cups today are very lovely, um, have handles, but our cups, if we were really 18th century people, would not have handles and we would hold oh, them yes. like this and we would sip it like that to show how genteel we were. There were a couple of other ways. Um, there's a famous painting that shows actually three people drinking tea and they're all holding their cups different ways. None of their cups have handles. <laughs> um, this was a good way because um, most cups did have some sort of a, a foot on the bottom to protect your hand and the table from the hot liquid and then holding it just at the rim also prevents you from burning your hand. <laughs> yeah, it's not a desirable thing. So let's give it a taste with sugar. actually not terrible with sugar. <laughs> she is such a tea snob. <laughs> you can't tell the people. <laughs> I, I do I do trust her the most with tea. If I ever have like questions about tea, I'm like, Kelsey, help me. So uh, yeah, that's that's our sugar in our tea. Um there was actually a couple of people who wrote about tea and really were kind of poo-pooing people who put sugar in their tea. They were saying, <laughs> if you put sugar in your tea, you might as well just drink like hot water with some sugar in it because the sugar overpowers the flavor of the tea um, mm -hmm. for less nice teas. And <laughs> then, yeah, what's the point of wasting the money on tea? You could just have hot sugar water. That is so true. That is so true. <laughs> so the idea of putting sugar in tea that we think of with milk and all of that came a lot later. You're going to have to come to my lecture if you want to find out. Yes. <laughs> Uh, please attend her lecture. She she goes everywhere. She also goes to the museum I work in. Uh, that's the Mount Vernon Hotel Museum and Garden. And stay tuned for more tea events by Kelsey Bro. <laughs> Thanks. All right, let's give this one more sip. All right, so we have just two of the leaves that we brewed for our booyah. I wanted to show you how big they are when they're unfurled most of the way. Those are massive. <laughs> yeah, full leaf, so we know it's good quality. And then this is just a piece where you can see the serrated edge really well. I wanted to show you that. Um, people would look at the edges of the leaves and think about how serrated they were, how not serrated they were. Um, later on in the 19th century when they started growing tea in India um, to see, again, even by 1840 people were not sure if black tea and green tea came from the same plant or not. Oh no! Uh, and when when you look at green tea, I mean, it looks totally different, right? Yes, it it's, does. Um, it looks pretty really easy different. to get confused um, and, and think, well, this surely can't be the same plant. It looks totally different. Surely, it smells not. totally different. Surely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that honestly, the buhi smells so much better. Yeah, well, it's a matter of taste. I mean, this is a lot more vegetal, a lot grassier. And yeah, our 18th century people were not drinking this. This is a shincha from Japan. That's um, a really new t um, green tea, one of the first green teas of the season. This is a Uji style, um, so it's very green. Um, really nice. They roll it um, into needle shapes, whereas the muyi was more of a really Oh, so round these shape. are rolled into this shape. Yeah, yeah. The other ones were rolled too. I should have mentioned that they're mm -hmm. they're um, withered um, mm -hmm. or oxidized in the air for an oolong tea, and these are not. They're um, steamed really fast so that they stay green, and then they're rolled into this needle shape. Whereas the other ones um, were rolled into kind of a ball shape. That makes a lot so of sense. So that really um, changes the character of the tea a lot. And we're getting a lot, like I said, vegetal smells, grassy smells mm -hmm. out of the shincha. It smells more like cut grass. It does have a, a not, certain, yeah, literal grassiness to it. Not literal cut grass, but like you 
you understand that. Like <laughs> when someone is out cutting vegetation, that's what it smells like. Yeah, so it's some really bright, crisp kind of smell and flavor to it. Um, people were aware of Japanese green tea, although they were more aware of matcha, which is actually becoming pretty trendy nowadays. Yes. Um, right. People were like, oh, in Japan they grind their tea to a powder. They, they were aware of it, but Japan wasn't really exporting a lot of tea. Mm. And this kind of nice um, shincha was not something that people were really able to drink until actually pretty recently in America. Mm. So we're jumping way into the future here. <laughs> yes. So this one, um, we're going to again put about two spoonfuls in. Actually, this kind of tea, you want to get a lot of tea going and you can brew it multiple times. And just like with the oolong tea, each steeping has a different flavor, as I'm sure you know. Oh, yes. So just fill this up. The leaves are so small on they here. That they're actually, for the most part, still hold leaves. They're just really, really finely rolled. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get a lot of really nice color out of these. So um, this kind of tea, today, when we drink green tea, we usually like to use lower temperature water than boiling. Um, especially this kind of fine Japanese green tea, you're actually going to use pretty almost room temperature water for something like this. Although you could go the just below boiling water for only a few seconds, the temperature that you're going to make your tea with really changes the taste. I did not. Well, I knew that they used different temperatures. I think I may be scorching my green tea. Yeah. A lot of people tend to do that. Um, it's force of habit for me, for me. and they um, actually in the packets, the packets that they give you with the tea bags, mm -hmm. um, even the good quality ones, they tell you to put um, hot water in, but they don't specify what hot water is, or they put some type of temperature. And most of us do not have um, like a temperature control on our kettle. So any advice for us tea idiots who don't know like what temperature, like I, I'm not the type of person to be able to like, oh, this is uh, about 90 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, um, well there's a Chinese way of looking at boiling water where they say um, shrimp eyes, fish eyes, the size of the bubbles tells you how hot it is. I mean, I don't have a lot of familiarity looking at shrimp eyes because I'm a vegetarian. But anyway, um, a good kind of rule of thumb is if you're not going to be able to measure exactly your temperature of water, start with the cold and then add the hot so that the leaves, the first thing that hits them is not the hot water that will burn them. Okay. Because you don't want to be, I mean, maybe you like the taste of burnt tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe we're all used to like burnt tea. Yeah, well, I think, wasn't I telling you a while ago at the Mount Vernon Hotel that when I was little, I went to a Japanese restaurant, I think for the first time in the fourth grade, and the tea is really bright green there. And I went home and I took out my uh, you know, grocery store brand of green tea and I thought, what can I do to make this green tea taste like Japanese green tea? I would try brewing it for different lengths of time or opening up the package, but it was actually Chinese green tea, so it wasn't gonna be that It wasn't gonna be that brilliant green we yeah, really yeah. love seeing. Well, and that's what's sort of interesting about the history of drinking green tea because yeah, we expect a, a brilliant green tea when we go to a Japanese restaurant. Um, and people kind of got this idea that green tea should be green in color because it's <laughs> called green. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so in China, they started doctoring the tea with different types of chemicals or indigo and um, actually sheep's dung. Oh, wow. Mm. I, I have heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that when you brew it, the liqueur becomes that bright green kind of emeraldy color. And oh, wait, this is, happening, this is happening today, or is that more... Hopefully this isn't happening so much <laughs> today. I mean, there is kind of this scandalous report that I think the, you know, not World Health, but some organization came out recently that a lot of Chinese teas are using pesticides. So, I had heard of that. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really come as much of a surprise when you think about the big growers. I buy from small single estate growers, which is not how they would have bought their tea back then because it was in such ginormous quantities. And I really like to use that silly word ginormous because it was almost silly how much tea they expected. Um, it, by 1670, the tea was still pretty expensive, but 20 years in the future, it's still expensive, but not like $1,000 for two ounces expensive. And the tea trade is really booming. Ships are arriving in China, and they have orders um, from, for the Chinese merchants saying, I need like, this big amount of 
tea, and the Chinese market was not used to this huge demand for tea, so they were just shipping everything. They would mix other types of leaves in to meet the crazy demand. So I mean, it's not always their fault. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And that's like a ridiculous amount. I had seen um, pictures of these giant lots of like ship shipments. And yeah. It's, um, ridiculous how much you were shipping. So to start with, are we gonna put? We're gonna put the cool water. Yeah. In first. So let's do that. Got water. <laughs> That's we're gonna good pour old it uh, right over the leaves mm -hmm. so that we're not gonna scorch them, and we're also kind of gonna help them open up a little bit. just resting in the cool water now we're going to add a little bit of just boiled water to bring it up to a warm temperature um so a lot of us uh, like it burnt <laughs> like maybe just by sheer ignorance <laughs> so now try try it this way and see if you like it better uh, yeah it, it makes a big difference so you know yeah. it's all about what you like you can see that our leaves here are really soaking up and expanding in the water. The liquid is turning light green. So this is the beautiful green tea. Oh, I'm getting used to this. <laughs> okay, oh, so we're going out with it. much better. <laughs> Can you feel in the back of your mouth some of that savoriness of the tea? This is only mm. the first steeping. If we did a second one, you'd get a little bit more of that. And this tea tastes alive. I, I can't explain it. It tastes alive. <laughs> yeah, I, I swear I didn't plant those words in Chinese. Well. That's actually really what you want. You want the water to be dancing. I've heard that word used before. If you use um, microwaved water, it, it doesn't boil the way that stove or electric kettle water actually like, physically bubbles and kind of brings the oxygen moving in the water, so it tastes much more flat. So, great word. Thank you. <laughs> yes. It's copyrighted people. <laughs> I don't think our 18th century friends would have liked this tea very much. I think it's a, a little bit too um, savory for them. Mm -hmm. The idea of putting sugar in it makes me want to cry. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> this is so good. Well, let me top you off then. Yay! A little bit more myself. And then I have a uh, special something for our second brewing. Uh -oh. She looks really scared. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking this down south. <laughs> so because I enjoy making Kelsey's life difficult for her <laughs> and surprising her, um, I'm actually going to try something out that I tried out recently with a friend. Um, I'm going to add Jack Daniels honey. It's whiskey with some lemon to it. Um, granted, I used the burnt green tea for <laughs> before, so it was very delicious. Maybe it was because it was hiding the burnt taste. <laughs> we don't know. So I know this is probably blasphemy for many tea drinkers to use such high quality tea for the likes of Jack Daniels. But, you know, my booskies expect Cheney to do stuff like this. <laughs> and it wouldn't be Not Your Mama's History if I didn't do something like this. So, right. how are we doing on the second steeping? So this one doesn't need as much time. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, wow. Yeah. That got really green. Yeah, it's really green already. You can see that. Really so, good. let's just make sure we're... Yeah, I think we're ready to go. Okay. So if you guys don't have um, Jack Daniels honey, you can actually use a little bit of actual honey. I would dilute it in just a tablespoon of boiling water, um, but this is actually really nice. So I'm going to squeeze just a bit of lemon into it, and then 
We'll add. <laughs> She's crazy. Okay. You just want a little bit. We don't want to drown it in whiskey unless um, you have a nice big mug. These are actually just <laughs> teacups. So ladies, please do not go pouring <laughs> because that's a shot. <laughs> that's not a <laughs> actual yeah. little taste. Give it a bit of a stir. And then you give it a taste. So I definitely feel that this is better with the, the non-burnt green tea because that burnt green tea, it really does not taste as good. It makes a difference even with the jacket. <laughs> it, it really does. How do you like it? Are you still crunching? <laughs> I, it's actually better than I was expecting. I think um, I'll have you invite me back in the winter when it's nice and cold. This would be good. Yes. See there, folks. <laughs> yes. So of course, with Not Your Mama's History, you gotta throw in, I have to throw in some something really crazy. <laughs> and not uh, just, actually putting whiskey in teas, um, I'm sure it was done. Um, I do know it was done in other drinks. It was also mixed with water um, and a lot of other things, but I just, I this is the first time I heard it in green tea I felt like I was being like groundbreaking and <laughs> apparently not I'm sure Martha Stewart beat me to it but we'll call this the Cheney whiskey tea <laughs> you know so Booskies thank you so much for joining us we had a wonderful time with Kelsey bro thank you for having me um you can actually find her uh this coming Saturday October 3rd um, at more Chamel for another tea tasting. Um, how much is it per person? Do you know? It's twenty dollars a person, it's and it comes with refreshments. So it's yes. Really um, actually, you get to. This is just a taste testing, as I just said before. So with when you go to any one of her tea tastings, you get to taste many different teas, and she gives you the history behind each as well as just a full history of tea. Everything you ever, ever wanted to know about tea or in the case of them putting dung in tea, things you didn't want to know. But like, you know the good, the bad, the ugly, and the wonderful. I really, really enjoyed myself. Also look forward to her coming to the Mount Vernon Hotel Museum again and garden. Um, as always, Love you, Booskies. Please remember to like us and subscribe. Bye. Bye.